afternoon. I know, I hope you stay awake. Um, the, uh, the subject, the uh, epigenetics, is the major driving force for health, medicine, longevity uh, into the future. It's as big a breakthrough as uh, we have for uh, antibiotics. Uh, and we're just beginning to realize the impact. Now, having said that, <laughs> there's much of what we don't understand and there are some misconceptions and so in these few minutes what i'd like to do is try to clarify some of these misconceptions about genetics versus epigenetics what we know what we're beginning to know and then to look over the horizon at some of the biotechnology that's coming in the next year or two that's going to make this extraordinary anyway that's who i am um the uh so we have a health uh, biomarkers versus disease prediction so much of what we see uh, now in the world of uh, genetics is disease prediction. You have an 80% likelihood of some dreaded disease. The problem is it doesn't tell you about all the people who have the same markers that do not end up and they're in the 20%. So wouldn't you rather be in the 20%? I would. That's the question that interests me and that's the area of healthy biomarkers. So your genes push you in a direction. What keeps you moving in a healthy direction? What, he what in turn pushes you down, makes you less. So genomics is the study of the gene itself. Uh, epigenetics is really around, above, uh, th that surrounds and gives the gene expression. So it's a different, same technology, different approach. One is kind of deterministic, reductionistic, biomedical. The other is a more healthy, optimistic, life-affirming. So this is genetics. <laughs> this is everything you need to know. Uh, there it is, Genetics 101 in one slide. I thought you'd really appreciate that. I, I love cartoons. I mean, you'll, you, there's a bunch of them in here. I, I've had people come up years later and say, I really like that lecture. And you go, you did? And they go, yeah, that cartoon was so good. So anyway, cartoons. Um, so what we're looking at, we're doing a, a large-scale research protocol looking at development of what we call a tripartite assay. And if you look at gen epigenetics, it's really in three parts. So the first is the gene. The gene is like the blueprint of a house. The second stage is then how is that manifest in your blood? It's a push in a direction. How does that change your biochemistry? It's like building the house in the body. And the third then is the biome, the intestinal tract from your mouth to anus, and that is er the byproduct. What happens after you have the gene, its expression in the blood goes through the end organ systems and the brain and emergence from the body. So this tripartite assay is what we're working, working on. And we do in fact realize that bad news is curiosity. So there are some irreducible things in genetics, but, but, and this is the critical factor, the irreducible, monogenic, fully penetrant genes occur between the six and nine month of life. After that, the vast majority of what we see as uh, genetic diseases, health, longevity is due to um, uh, epigenesis. So how do, how do we know that this works? Are the, the gene does not change. Okay, the gene is invariant unless it's damaged by radiation uh, or environmental toxins. So around the gene is a molecular sheath. It's called a single nucleotide polymorphism, a mouthful. So abbreviated as SNPs, S-N-P-S. And it's a coding that is like a rheostat. It turns the gene on, turns the gene down, up or down in terms of intensity, express or suppress. And the genetic variation in that um, rheostat system on the gene is where we operate. That's how we influence our genetic inheritance. So this is, you don't look anything like the long-haired skinny kid I married 25 years ago. I need a DNA sample to be sure it's still you. Um, <laughs> you would show up as being the same person genetically. You would be very different, as you can see, epigenetically. That's the, the difference between the two approaches. Okay, so the research project is between Thorne, which is a nutraceutical company in New York, uh, Wellness FX, which is a biomarker startup in San Francisco, and the Mayo Clinic, which provides the laboratory analysis for these three parts. Uh, what we're studying is a group of about 100 um, elite athletes uh, from the Olympic Games in uh, Brazil, uh, members of special forces, military special forces, uh, presidents, CEOs of companies, people that are functioning at a very high level, and we want to see what do they look like. What does that gene look like? How does it set a high bar for us? 
Um, so what we're looking at is, are the genetics of these individuals, the blood sample, and the microbiome, and we're looking at those three together. Um, in terms of selection of biomarkers, again, this is, you know, we, there are about 12 or 15 companies advertising genetic testing. The problem is multifold. Uh, I mean, they're, they're really terrible, quite honestly. What, we're, what we are using are genetic biomarkers that are constant from time one to time two. So we took blood samples of our own, submitted them to a lab, froze the sample, three months later submitted the same sample and got totally different results. <laughs> Not good. Um, that changes can be made in the expression of these genes in an interval of 12 to 15 weeks. Many of these changes occur in hours and days, but tw 10 to 12 weeks is as much time as it takes for an epigenetic change. And these are, and that's the, uh, and they can be made by actionable lifestyle changes. So we're not looking for at things that people cannot influence and they're commercially available. So those are the criteria for the selection. Those genes govern these seven, this is basic biochemistry, okay, the straight out of the textbooks. Um, those genes govern these same, these seven basic pathways. These pathways in turn affect, I'm not gonna go into these, um, but they affect the internal organs. So this is the uh, advice we generally come up with. Uh, eat less, exercise more, and invent a time machine so you can go back and choose parents with better genetics. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's sometimes the advice you get from these online genetic samples. Um, so what we've done is this is the display we're giving back, and this would be something that you'll see probably in a year or two. It'll be a, a commercially available, relatively inexpensive, no physicians involved, you can go direct to the laboratory and get these assays. You might say, why? The point is, if we, when I come to conferences like this, I hear about ketogenic diets, uh, low fat, high fat, this kind of meditation, that kind of meditation, interval training, non-interval training, uh, every other day, it's, it's this barrage. But when we don't ask, who are we? When you know who you are, then you can answer those questions. You know if you metabolize lipids very well. There are people that can eat the most high, high fat diet on the planet and not have a problem with heart disease or any other lipid related conditions. So for them to eat a low fat diet is just torture. They don't need to do it. So what this does is it gives us a picture of who we are biochemically and answers those questions. Um, this is actually a close up, if you will. This is, a, uh, re this is real data, but a, a, a fake patient. And you can see on the, on the left side, uh, started out in the red zone. And by tracking and providing information on how that person could modify it, they've moved all of their variables over the course of four samples in roughly two years all to essentially all in the green zone. So when we have information, we have choice. And the choice is to create optimal health, optimal longevity. That's our goal, is to give us a map give us a pathway. Um, so it's this, I demand a DNA test. <laughs> it's how do you really know? You've got to find out. Um, and this then is the last element. The genetic and the blood is already available. Those are commercial, they're out there. A number of companies provide those. The really difficult part is the biome, the intestinal tract, because there are more bacteria in the intestinal tract, again, from the mouth to the anus, then in the entire human body. There are more than a trillion cells in the intestinal tract. For women, if you include the reproductive organs, it's millions more, so it's even a more exaggerated. And we've all heard about the brain-gut connection, that what we eat, what we consume, the byproduct of all of our metabolism has a profound effect on our brain. The most receptor site for particular molecules we find in the intestinal tract is in the brain. So is the, there is this intimate connection, this bi-directional communication. Um, and so we're, the last part we're looking at, there are about 300 cell colonies, and we're trying to interpret those, those colonies. If you walked in a, a grocery store, the barcodes are on everything. It would tell you all you wanted to know. You can't read it. <laughs> and that's the problem right now. We really don't know how to read the microbiome code, but we're, we're getting better. I think in a year or two, it'll be done. Um, and it will result in real information you can use. So this says, don't take these if you're nursing pregnant or about to become pregnant. Well, <laughs> it's probably not gonna do him a lot of good to have any of that information. So we're really trying to find information that is, is individualized, personalized. 
And, uh, and again, that's the ultimate goal. So now I'm going to look over the horizon just quickly. Two technologies, there are many more. The biotechnology area is making our ability to do epigenetic assays, to make them actionable, to help us to really influence and determine the course of our life. So this is an ingestible nanotechnology. So it's a, a computer. It's literally the size of the head of a pin. You ingest it. And for as long as it takes to pass through the body, which is anywhere between 24 and 72 hours, it transponds information to a patch on your arm, to your handheld. So it gives you, maybe you can get 50 or 60 biological variables. It tells you precisely what's going on. So here's an instance, we did a study with diabetes and you see in the upper left, here's a person who's consistently dosing their medication, a good blood chemistry response, and down in the lower right is someone who's not, re not just not taking their medications properly or eating foods that are having a dramatic impact on their blood chemistry, but they really don't know it. So this is a way to tell us unequivocally, it can take months, sometimes years, to get a uh, diabetic medication regimen with the uh, pharmaceuticals and diet for individuals. We can do this in a matter of days. And it's the same information. So your doctor has the information, you have the information, and it really is the basis for you know, common, uh, common development. Um, this is then a, another new technology. How many of you like blood draws? Let me see your hands. Oh, everybody loves them, okay. I've never seen anyone say yes, <laughs> right? And they're awful. Um, and finger pricks are painful. Um, so this is a device which is a painless blood draw technology based on vacuum. So this little device looks like about half of a tennis ball. You put it on your upper arm and in 45 seconds it draws 200 microliters of blood. From that you can derive 50 or 60 markers or blood samples. So everything you can do with a full-born blood draw you can do with this little uh, device. It's totally painless. Um, you take it off, it's like a little red spot on your arm, disappears in about a half hour. Uh, the best thing about it is the technology is very sophisticated. When it's drawn out, it's stable at room temperature. You know, with a, a blood draw, you have to cold pack it and get it to a lab within a certain amount of time for analysis, and you worry that it's going to be contaminated, maybe the lab gets it all wrong. Um, th there are many, many problems with phlebotomy. Uh, but this is a anywhere, anytime, 45 seconds. You can do it yourself. You don't need a physician's orders. You don't need physician's offices. You don't need access to a lab. So these are all things over the counter that will be enable us to make better and more informed decisions. So this is <laughs> the last, I think, PowerPoint. It says, oh, master, is it proper for a monk to use email? He says, sure, as long as there are no attachments. Uh, so... It, it seems odd to be using such high biotechnology uh, to answer something about epigenetics, but that's precisely what's occurring. And this, I, I think this is kind of the most uh, exciting direction to be going in. And I think I'm actually uh, under time and, oh, this, sorry, this is a summary. Ta-da, drum roll. Um, so what do we know? The tri there's a tripartite assay of genetic blood and microbiome. That's what we're working on. Uh, that genes predict probabilities, not certainties. When you have a DNA or 23andMe, it says X percentage of you're likely to have irritable bowel. Well, what does that really mean? It means you've got a likelihood, not a certainty. Uh, there are biomarkers of health, not disease prediction. So we're not looking at predicting cancer. We're not looking at predicting heart disease. We're looking at predicting biomarkers that you can modify. Um, applications of single genes, single disease is very limited, six to nine months of fully penetrant monogenic diseases, very few, less than 5% of what we know as human disease is monogenic or fully penetrant. Uh, genes work within complex interactions with other genes and within the context of the environment has a profound impact, stress, diet, exercise. Uh, the physical environment, our psychosocial environment, happiness as per the previous speaker. It's a huge impact on gene expression. Um, the human base is 21,000 genes and less than 5% of that is what we know. We know 5% of how that functions. The rest of it is called the dark genome. We have no idea what's going on there. I mean, that, that to me is talking about a, a ex exploration. Uh, genes are turned on or turned off like a rheostat. Gene expression changes. What we do matters. 
The majority of genes are governed by beliefs, by choices and lifestyle, and Neanderthal genes are alive and well. Um, it turns out that all of us have Neanderthal genes, and those, you think about the stress response, anger, frustration, aggression, we will perhaps find the root for that. So that is it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you.